right now to start the day, we're very happy to have Atul Sharma, who's going to tell us about self joint gravity as a topological string. <coughs> Thanks, David. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Um, most of you might not know me. I was Lionel's PhD student and uh, graduated in 22, and now I'm doing a postdoc at Harvard in celestial holography adjacent stuff. And this project was motivated by trying to find holographic duals for self-dual GR. We're not there yet, but uh, okay, this project arose from conversations with Matthew Hademan and Kumran Wafa. Matt Hademan is also a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, we are trying to find holographic duals for self-dual gravity by means of what's known as the n equals to string theory, which is like a cousin of superstring theory. But it turns out that the n equals to string can be embedded in something called the n equals four topological string. But nobody had actually fleshed out this n equals four topological string very well. So what I'm gonna to try to do in this talk is just, this talk won't have any holography by itself. All it'll have is a proper construction of the n equals four topological string that Berkowitz and Waffa didn't do in 94. And hopefully, in the coming months or so, we'll find some interesting utilities for this. But the, the point of interest to this audience would be that the target space effective field theory of this n equals four topological string is something familiar. It's uh, part of that theory of the gravitational sector of that theory is just self-dual GR on a Ritchie flat self-dual background. Okay, so let's start with some motivation. Self-dual GR provides a promising toy model of 4D gravity. Uh, it's integrable, and with appropriate matter content, it can also be quantized in an integrable way, in a fairly controlled way. The nonlinear graviton, this everyone here knows, it's the masterpiece of twisted theory. At least at the classical level, it manifests the classical integrability, the integrability of self-dual GR. You can find explicit solutions, and you can turn a complex partial differential equation problem into a simpler algebraic or cauchy riemann type problem. And classical integrability allows you to find large swaths of non-perturbative backgrounds, which are of high interest nowadays in studies of the gravitational path in people, and have been since Hawking's time, of course. Gibbons Hawking spaces were originally constructed for the study of gravitational path in people's and non-trivial backgrounds. But then, that's the classical story. This raises the natural question of whether we can quantize self-dual GR in any interesting way. Unfortunately, the tool of integrability that helps you solve SDGR at tree level doesn't help you very much at loop level because it already fails. By itself in self-dual GR, it already fails at one loop. It's violated by the presence of one loop amplitudes if, the, if integrability had survived, then there would have been some infinite dimensional symmetry algebra in flat space, and Coleman Mandela would then tell you that the amplitudes have to vanish. So how do we get around this? There are, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the introduction. Could you clarify the, the question of the signatures? That this, is it? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'll be in Euclidean section. Maybe you'll do that later, or maybe you'll do it now? Uh, no, I was going to... Uh, it is going to be Euclidean signature. It's all throughout. Yeah. Four dimensional Euclidean signature throughout. <coughs> I think you can also do it in two comma two signature, but I'll write everything in Euclidean for now. That's also what these uh, gravitational path integral people are interested in for simple reasons. Yeah, but this is the standard path. When you go to, you will rotate, go to path integral, but then you still claim that. You are quantizing the theory with the signature minus plus plus plus. Yeah, that's a bit weird. Agreed. Yeah. So this is a standard thing of, of quantum field theory. So yeah. Now here you say that you will quantize separately something which has positive signature and yeah. without direct. So we'll just as a toy model we'll just study that. Oh, it's alright. Just to set yeah. the stage. In fact, uh, because of self duality, you can't even continue these things to real metrics and Lorentzian signature, which is one of the reasons, which is the main reason why I'm an Euclidean signature. But the hope is that you can still rotate the, the Schwinger functions at the end or something. I mean, that's the... 
<laughs> well, <laughs> that's the usual answer you get from in full GR. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is this is just self dual GR, so even that might not be possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, they compute a lot of these Euclidean wormholes and stuff, and I don't know how to actually interpret them in a Lorentzian way. In lower dimensional, the, in two and three dimensions, people have been trying to construct Lorentzian wormholes at the IAS. And I don't know to what degree they succeed in solving their problems with the gravitational path integral, or problems with unitarity. Okay, so uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, a natural route that I'll take is to quantize STGR. Well, what I'll do is I'll show you how to embed self-dual GR in a certain new kind of topological string theory, this n equals four topological string that I was mentioning. And once you embed it in a string theory, then you can imagine that you can quantize it because of modular invariance, the string theory removes your UV divergent re uh, regions in one loop amplitude. This is not to say that this might be the only way to quantize STGR. We are still hoping that we might be able to engineer some field theory on twister space, some kind of twister action that allows you to quantize it. But any way of quantizing the SCGR will definitely have to tackle with its loss of integrability by itself. And in some work with Roland and David, we showed explicitly at one loop that the construction of nonlinear graviton viewed as a quantum field theory on twister space will develop a gravitational anomaly. So now let me tell you a little bit about the string theory that I'll construct. So our string theory will not have anything to do with twister space. I apologize in advance, sorry. <laughs> Don't throw me out. It will take space time itself as target space. So it'll be fairly simple theory. Uh, the reason it can do this without going against the 10 dimensional paradigm is because it's a topological string and it doesn't have any critical dimension. So the string theory will straight up live in a four dimensional self-dual Ricci flag for manifold. And in Euclidean signature, such spaces are hypercalar. And I'm gonna talk about non-compact hypercalars. Uh, as I said, one of the main hopes for trying to construct such a string theory is to look for holographic dualities, which are basic, uh, so you imagine that on one side of the duality, you have this very complicated gravitational theory uh, and on the other side of the duality, you might have some much simpler non-gravitational theory to, on, in which you can do computations. So another hope would be to access some zero cosmological constant, so Ricci flat holographic dualities for self-dual GR through such embeddings in string theory. And this is ongoing work with uh, Matt and Kumran. Okay. So that was the introduction. Any more questions about the motivation? So let me quickly review the idea of self-dual GR in the language of Plabansky. Currently, a self-dual Ricci flat space time <laughs> M with metric Riemannian metric G obeys that its Riemann tensor has to be equal to its Hodge dual. So here you view the Riemann tensor as a two form on either its first two or its last two indices, and you Hodge dualize with respect to G. And then if the metric is self-dual and Ricci flat, then that equation has so that's the equation of motion of self-dual gravity. You can do a gauge fixing of this equation of motion, which Flavansky did in four dimensions, and get something called Flavansky's heavenly equation. So if you can uh, gauge fix the metric to that kind of form. So x1, y1, and x2, y2 are some complex coordinates on your target space. And uh, so uh, the local model is just C2, so just imagine starting with C2, putting a metric on it, and then perturbing it by a finite amount that's encoded by the second derivatives of a single scalar field phi. And in physics language, that scalar field phi is the degree of freedom of a positive helicity graviton. Although, is it possible that in the Hessian you should have y's and log? Sorry, in the metric you should have y's and log x's. It doesn't really matter. I had y's early. I just changed them to x's because of my well, future. Well, you're saying wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it wrong? It's the same, right? If I have y's or x's. Because uh, well, uh, you did the generous y's and x's. x is over multiplying by dy dy. Did I write it wrong? <laughs> Sorry. Lyle, do you remember? I think you must be right. 
<laughs> Sorry? You need second groups with respect to x times the run of your app. I can't remember. So that's not uh, uh, but it's uh, so let me write the correct thing. The plus operator plus. Oh, no, no, no. So no, 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 no. equation, the, the formula, formula for the metric. It, it's, it's, it's the formula for the metric. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I changed both of them. I had y's in one and x's in the other. And I, just, I think I changed one, but not the other. Sorry about that. So the correct metric is d by i, d by j. No, it's not. It's okay, not. okay, okay. This must be the correct metric. Right? Yeah. Is that correct? Good. I think so. Okay. Thank you very much. That is a very important point <laughs> that I will never come back to again. Sorry, can I ask, what, what sort of Laplacian is it differentiating the Laplacian? So that's the flat space, the C2 Laplacian, just flat space Laplacian on C2 with respect to X and Y. And what sign? Oh, uh, Euclidean. So dx1. Laplacian is trace of the Hessian or minus trace of the Hessian. Right. Oh, so you heard about the others. <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever sign makes that equation work. Yeah, yeah, I think they've got it. <laughs> it's a very sign for which that equation is true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe a permutation of x and y. Yeah, it's either that or it's a minus that and then plus that. <laughs> It, it, these are like 1980s things. You find them in my papers. <laughs> but the met yeah, that second term in the metric, that should be two derivatives with respect to x and dy dy. That's an important type of thing. Anyway, it's, it's correct in units in which plus one equals minus one. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, is not, not, which is not true. <laughs> Okay, so we'll build a string theory whose equation of motion is that equation, this nonlinear PD for the scalar field phi. Okay. The idea is to embed SPGR, well, that equation of motion, as a subsector of a known string theory, which is the B model. The B model was a topological string that was constructed by Witten in the 90s. And we'll uh, opposed, as opposed to Witten, who works in, I suppose more like BCOV, Comre in France, who works on Calabria three poles, I'm going to put it on C2, which can be done quite straightforwardly. Uh, these strings don't have any critical dimension, so it, they can be put on any Calabria manifolds. But of course, for us, the interest will be the hypercalar structure of C2 and not just its uh, flat uh, calar structure. View, view phi is generating a finite deformation of the trivial hypercalar structure of C2. And this happens to be exactly the purview of what's called n equals 4 topological strings. Also, I'm working in C2 just to make the notation easier in this talk. The theory will be more non-trivial in an actual curved hypercalar four manifold. So the n equals 4 topological string was a theory that was first developed by Berkowitz and Waffa, but it was developed as, not as a proper string theory, it was developed as a chiral ring of some 4 comma 4 supersymmetric sigma model. The uh, in the sense that the appropriate theory of gravity on the world sheet, which you would call topological gravity, was not provided. And this is the main thing that we'll attempt to remedy, and we'll find that as soon as you accommodate the correct theory of topological gravity, all the constraints that reduce the degrees of freedom to that of a self-dual GR, a hypercalar perturbation, pop out quite nicely. So, okay, we'll work on C2 for simplicity with standard double null coordinates. That is correct. It has determinant correct. Yeah. So, the 2D supersymmetric sigma model has action given by that. So this might be familiar from just standard string theory courses. The first term is just the bosonic sigma model, where here, partial and bar partial are just derivatives with respect to z and z bar, and z is this well sheet coordinate. 
So the excess are bosons, the size are fermions, the Grassmann odd objects, and they carry some similar indices. So alpha alpha dot is an index of the tangent space. The fermions usually would also have carried indices in the tangent space, but I make them slightly distinct for reasons that will become clear in a second. So the fermions carry another, so alpha and alpha dot are spinner indices of opposite chirality. Capital A is also a two component spinner index. And I'm gonna make alpha and alpha dot take values 0, 1, 0 dot, 1 dot, and capital A will take values plus minus. Usually you'd use some rotation of frame to identify it with the tangent bundle, but uh, it's useful to keep it separate. The bosons X are spin zero before the twist, and the fermions are spin half, which tells you how they transform under conformal maps of the world sheet. But the fermion spins after twisting will get rotated to certain integer values after twisting. So that's the usual story that you might be familiar with if you've come across this subject. And I'll review it in a bit. So twisting entails restricting the space of states. So this is a two-dimensional sigma model. It's a quantum field theory. You can construct a Hilbert space of states. Twisting entails restricting the space of states <coughs> to the cohomology of a nilpotent supercharge. The theory has a bunch of supersymmetries, and you can pick certain supercharges, certain nilpotent supersymmetries, and try to restrict to the cohomology of those supersymmetries. To find such supercharges, let's begin by listing the symmetries of this sigma model. Sigma models into hypercalar <coughs> target spaces possess what's known in the literature as a small n equals 4, 4 superconformal symmetry. The, bracket, the 4, 4 here just represents 4 for the left movers, 4 for the right movers. And I'm just going to do the left mover case. The right mover case will be completely mirror. Uh, for a C2 target, I can write the symmetry currents explicitly. The symmetries are generated by the following left moving chiral currents. The first current is the ordinary Verisoro stress tensor, appropriate for a spin half fermion or the spin zero boson. The currents of interest, then, are the four supersymmetries of this model. So all of these are functions of Z and Z bar. That's why they're, that's why they're currents. And they're all going to be holomorphic on the support of the equations of motion. So that's why they are chiral currents and generate symmetries. The GA alphas are four supersymmetries. All you do is contract the alpha dot index. And uh, the four supersymmetries are rotated by a certain SU2R symmetry group which is generated by these three currents that are bilinears in the fermions. So T has conformal weight two, G, A, alpha have conformal weight three half, and the J's have conformal weight one on the left before twisting. Happy, okay. And similarly, you can get right moving currents by just identical expressions. You just replace all the partials by bar partials and all the size by side totals. These currents obey the small n equals 4 superconformal algebra. So let me write that. Uh, this was found by Adamolo et al. in 1976. I met uh, one of the authors of this paper two, uh, two days ago, and I didn't realize he's an author of the paper, and I started telling him about this. And then he told me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let me go on and tell you about the algebra. So well, there were many authors in this paper. There were many. That, so this is why we're confused. Anyway, so I'm gonna write. Uh, I'm gonna take our p's at z and zero, and on the right, all the currents are evaluated at z equals zero. So it's like a Laurent expansion in, around z equals zero. So the currents. I'll write down the non-trivial p's. The first non-trivial p is the standard Verisoro algebra formed by the stress tensor in two complex dimensions. It has central charge six before you add the ghosts and stuff. Next, the supercurrents GA alpha rotate as spin three half conformal primaries under this Verisoro. And the R symmetry currents JAB rotate as spin one primaries. Then you start getting interesting relations. You find that the SU2 currents, as their name suggests, generate an SU2 Katz-Moody algebra at some level, level one or half, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> then, the, as expected, the 
supercurrents transform as SU2 primary, so the fun in the fundamental representation of that SU2 current algebra. This is why it was important to make the indices uh, capital A and little alpha separate, because the SU2 only acts on the capital indices and leaves the target space spinner index alpha untouched. Uh, let me try this. Sorry, also, can you go back one slide for me? Sorry. I can. Okay. He knows it's a bit clunky. Uh, okay, sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to do this. Once you get your exercise. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's the SU2, some, uh, fundamental of SU2 transformation. Epsilons here, I forgot to say, are the two by two Levichuritas in whatever indices they are. And uh, most interestingly, and this is what really helps you with the twisting, the supercurrents, uh, the OPE of the supercurrents closes upon the same set of currents. And uh, the last term that appears in the supercurrent, one of those components I'm going to take as my deformed stress tensor. That's how you motivate the deformed stress tensor. To go the right, the, the shifted stress tensors. Okay, so let us start. Uh, any questions about the algebra? It's a very simple, yeah, SU2 representation of structure. So let's start by listing the available B twists of this sigma model. By a B twist, I mean that the stress tensor on both the left and the right movers are shifted. So T is the original, T and T tilde were the original stress tensor. I take the new stress tensor curly T as T plus half del J and T tilde as T tilde plus half del J tilde. That's motivated from what appears in the last entry of the GGOPE that I was just mentioned. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, and J here is going to be one of the three SU2 currents. You have to pick a Cartan subalgebra of your SU2. So take, so I had J capital A capital B. I'm gonna take the J plus minus component of that as my Cartan. I'm just going to denote it by J and the right mover by J tilde, and then define these uh, twisted stress tensors. If we take T and T tilde as our new stress tensor, then the spinners that are positively charged, so that's the capital A index here, which is plus here. The spinners that are positively charged, I'm gonna, that's how I'm going to refer to them, become spin zero with respect to these new stress tensors. And the spinners, which were negatively charged, which had a minus index for capital A, for the left movers, they become spin one comma zero, and for the right movers, they become spin zero comma one. And as a result, now you can construct a bunch of scalar commuting nilpotent supercharges. And making them scalar is really important if you want to put them on a general world sheet. Here I did everything on an affine world sheet, but once you construct some scalar supercharges, you can put them on non-trivial Riemann surfaces. Okay, so we will focus on twists that are obtained by picking a complex structure, U alpha and CP1. So C2 is hyperscalar, and its complex structures are labeled by C points on CP1. Pick a, uh, in homogeneous coordinates, pick a point U with subscript alpha and CP1, and take cohomology <laughs> of the Hilbert space of states of the string theory, with respect to this supercharge. So what are these g's? When I have g and I contour integrate along z equals zero, so contour integrate around z equals zero, the contour integral picks out the zero mode of that current, so that's no longer dependent on uh, z and z bar. It's just some supercharge that acts on the fields of the world sheet theory. And if I take q cohomology with respect to this combination, it picks out specific combinations of those fields that I'm gonna call states of my theory. Until now, this is the standard story of the topological sigma model. Any questions about this? It's basically a review, yeah. It's a, it's a non-critical string to start with, right? To start with, it's a non-critical string. Yeah, I should mention this, but once you do this twist, it becomes critical in any dimension and add the ghosts of this. Uh, sorry, no. Yeah, it becomes non-critical even without the ghost because what happens is that the X bosons, their central charge cancels the central charge of the fermions because the fermions became one zero and zero. 
that, and the girl's central charge cancels by itself. Is, is there a way of making new dynamical, or are you always just going to pick the choice of you? I'm just going to fix a choice of you. This is the, yeah, so CP1 is like the nilpotence variety of this set of twists, and then U is just a choice of twists that you do. I don't know of a way to make U dynamical, but. That's whether you want to do at some point, this theory has a bit of a freedom. I'll mention it. I don't. I, this choice of you was something that I picked by hand, like one choice of twist. But at some point, the theory says I'm happy with everything. So there might be a way to, there might be a sense in which I could average over the choice of views. But I don't know how to. Yeah, I haven't really tried very hard. Okay. So in some sense, this might be a richer story than the usual B moral. Because in the usual B model, you have one twist or something. You have a simpler nilpotence variety. Here you have a sphere's worth of twists. So on C2 target, all the twists will be equivalent because of the <coughs> SU2 symmetry, SU2 left cross SU2 right symmetry. But on a general hyperkähler manifold, all the twists will be genuinely different. Like on an ALE or a Gibbons Hawking manifold, there might be interesting twists at interesting points. OK, the supercharge Q which I described earlier, is a world sheet avatar of the target space D bar operator. So apologies for the already confusing notation. Sometimes, it should be clear from context that sometimes D bar is the world sheet derivative and sometimes it's the target space D bar operator, but I'll try to mention it as many times as I can. So in our choice of complex structure, the complex coordinates on the target space are the contractions of the U alpha into X alpha alpha dot and its quaternionic conjugate into X alpha alpha dot. And X alpha alpha dot itself obeys some uh, Euclidean reality conditions. Now let us briefly recall the standard lore of how you map target space data into space-time data and see this Q being D bar. So one first defines these combinations of left and right moving positively charged spinners, uh, scalar spinners, Grassmann or scalars. Eta alpha dot and theta alpha dot, okay? Symmetric and anti-symmetric. And then one interprets eta alpha dot as being the world sheet avatar of the anti-holomorphic differential forms. And one interprets theta alpha dot as being the world sheet avatar of d by dx alpha dot, the holomorphic vector fields. This is in the following sense. Every element of, so every section of the sheaf of poly vectors valued in uh, not L forms map to an operator in the world sheet theory. So if I take a, such a polyvector polyform, so it's a holomorphic polyvector and an anti-holomorphic polyform, I'm dropping the wedges for notational brevity, then this thing can be mapped to an operator in the world sheet theory by just replacing the dx hats by the etas and the partial derivatives with respect to excess by the theta. And the supercharge, the, act, the world sheet action of the supercharge coincides with the world sheet, the operator that corresponds to just D bar A acting on here and then doing this correspondence. So it's in that sense that Q acts as a D bar operator. And Q cohomology reduces to D bar cohomology, which is trivial on C2, but as I said, keep saying, you can put it on non-trivial hyperkähler targets. This is just the story of the topological sigma model. Now we want to turn this into a topological string. And to do that, one needs to couple it to topological gravity. To get the usual B model string theory, Witten couples the B model to ordinary topological gravity. Topological gravity is a theory where the world sheet metric has a shift symmetry by arbitrary translations. That's why it's topological. So what we, what we, and he couples it to that, and he gets a ghost system, which is a normally free central charge free by itself. What we need to do, yeah, and that gives a theory that's adapted to the Kähler structure and more precisely the Calabi L structure. What we need to do to get a topological string adapted to the hyperkähler structure is to couple our topological stigma model to a new topological supergravity theory that we obtain by twisting 2D n equals 4 supergravity. So Witten's topological gravity is obtained by twisting 2D n equals 2. We'll start with 2D n equals 4 and we'll try to twist it. Uh, it will emerge from the twist of the gravitational theory. Oh, 
The choice of view is the only thing that doesn't emerge. That's why I was telling you that there might be some sense in which one could average over it. But the choice of what currents to gauge and these supercharges, these scalar supercharges, will emerge from the topological gravity. Yes, haven't you, by choosing you, haven't you already sort of broken the n equals 4? Which we're supposed to break. So it's yeah. supposed to be a subalgebra of n equals 4, such that it's a, norm, a central charge free by itself. So that's the game, yeah. I will break it explicitly, that is the game. The construction of 2D topological gravity, so that's like a fully covariant construction, but I'm gonna start, I'm gonna instead discuss a construction that works by starting with a larger 2D n equals four and then twisting it down to, by breaking it down to a subalgebra. So the construction of 2D topological gravity by twisting supergravity was formalized in this work by Tiesler and Nelson for the usual B model case, and then by Nelson and collaborators shortly after that for some other simple cases. But for some reason, they didn't study the case that I wanted to study, so I had to do it myself. <laughs> so their idea is essentially a supersymmetric analog of the idea of the reduction of structure group of a vector bundle by giving some structure. In their case, this happens to be the fermionic vector bundle that enters the definition of a super Riemann surface, which I'll define on the next slide. And let us illustrate this formalism by studying the case. We'll illustrate this by studying the case of interest to us, which will be the case of n equals four super Riemann surfaces. So let me first remind you what the definition of a super Riemann surface was. So a super Riemann surface was firstly a complex super manifold. It had one, oh, sorry. It had one bosonic direction, which is, which corresponds to a complex coordinate Z, and capital N amount of fermionic um, directions, which correspond to complex Grassmann or coordinates theta i's. And uh, there's some more structure on a super Riemann surface. The super Riemann surface is like a fermionic analog of a complex manifold in that it contains a basis of local holomorphic vector fields. So it has like a holomorphic structure on it. Uh, the bosonic part of the holomorphic basis is just d by dz, and the fermionic part is spanned by this, these combinations, capital Di, which I think appear in supersymmetry literature, and that's why the mathematicians just chose these combinations. I don't know how they came up with these. But these are the combinations that are sort of, that preserve the Kronecker delta metric and instead of the UN metric, they preserve like an ON metric. And that's why the R symmetric group of this structure happens to be, or the structure group happens to be ON. Now, uh, the other data for a super Riemann surface is that it has to be patched together using superconformal transition functions. So just like a complex manifold is patched together using holomorphic or conformal maps in two dimensions, this is patched together using superconformal maps. And these are just defined to be those maps that are holomorphic transition functions along the z direction. And uh, the di's, these vector fields, should transition and rotate among themselves. So the di's go to some new d tilde j's, which are d by d theta tilde plus theta tilde d by d z tilde. But they should rotate among themselves. Now, if you use chain rule, and compute the transition of di, then di becomes a linear combination of the d tildes and the partial z tildes. You just set the component along partial z tilde to zero, and you get this conformality condition that the super Riemann surface has to obey. And this is a PDE, which requires just a mild integrability condition that this matrix of rotations, normalized by some useless thing that you don't need to worry about, is an element of ON. That's the mild integrability condition that you can derive by differentiating it one more time with respect to DI and using the anti-commutators for DIs. So in this sense, the ON group becomes a structure group of the subbundle spanned by these DIs because the DIs rotate by these ON rotations up to this sphere factor. Okay, for us, we are interested, uh, we have computational control more on the infinitesimal superconformal transformations. Uh, infinitesimal superconformal transformations are generated by a single holomorphic vector superfield, capital V, 
It is a holomorphic function of z and theta, but not, so it's not a function of z bar and theta bars. But other than that, it's an arbitrary, vec uh, arbitrary super field on the Vel shape. And uh, the transformations are then given by these formulae. So the theta i sort of rotate by infinitesimally by the derivatives of v, and the delta z rotate by whatever is required to compensate so that the equation on the previous slide is satisfied. OK. And then you def compute that matrix of rotations, rij, which was on value. And you get a Lie algebra element from that, which you then require to be valued in the Lie algebra of OM. So that's this object. Uh, any questions up to that? OK. Then we can specialize to the case of n equals 4 super Riemann surfaces. In this case, the coordinate, the index on the theta i is, is going to be a combination of capital A and, cap, and alpha. That's the composite index that was labeling my four supersymmetries. Infinitesimal superconformal transformations are then generated by an arbitrary holomorphic vector superfield, which I can just expand in components like that. So for example, the first component, which comes with no thetas, will generate with a sort of transformations. These sides will generate supersymmetries, and the t's and t alphas will generate some rotations. Unfortunately, this by itself gives the large n equals 4 superconformal algebra. So now you know what both of them are. But this also gives a nice example of how these reductions to lower symmetry are, uh, can be done. So this has double the amount of symmetries that I was discussing in my sigma model previously. To get the small n equals 4 superconformal algebra, one needs to restrict the structure group to an SU2 subgroup of the O4, the O4 acts combinedly on the composite index A alpha. I want to restrict these matrices of rotation to the SU2 subgroup that acts only on capital A and capital K. At the Lie algebra level, this requires that my Lie algebra element be an element of the SU2 algebra that rotates capital indices. And that just tells you, you do some algebra and you get the, this equation that says that the vector superfield V, so two derivatives of the vector superfield should be uh, spin zero with respect to the SU2 that acts on alpha and beta. So the spin one component, which would have been the symmetrized component, vanishes. And this picks out exactly the small n equals four superconformal algebra for you. Oh, I forgot the reference. Sorry, that was paper right here. Sorry about that. Uh, Vector fields of this form generate the small n equals 4 algebra. And in this sense, we have obtained it as a reduction <laughs> of structure group. Okay? And we want to apply So this is a good example to learn this idea. Now we want to apply the same idea to reduce the structure group to that of a twisted subalgebra. So let's do that. So to do that, choose a spinner diode, micron and iota. Capital A is an SL2 index. Choose a spinner diode for that. For simplicity, just take a micron to be 1, 0, and iota to be 0, 1. Twisting entails further structure group reduction to those transformations that preserve one of your cho uh, chosen spinners. So this is going to be just some constant spinner, and I'm twisting on a flat world sheet, so I can do this. Right, and that's this PDE that now V, the allowed superconformal maps, have to satisfy. This reduces the R symmetry algebra SU2 acting on A down to the U1 subalgebra that fixes that spinner of micron. And the remaining superconformal transformations can be explicitly computed. And you're left with exactly four free functions, four free holomorphic functions of Z, plus a pair of constants, chi alpha. So V, psi alpha. V, Xi alpha, and T were part of the rotations. V was the Virasoro. The Xi's would be two supercurrents out of the four of the small n equals four algebra. And T is a U1 subgroup. T generates a U1 carton subgroup of the uh, R symmetry SU2 algebra. But in addition to that, you also get the two generators corresponding to the spin zero scalar supercharges. So this construction gives you all the generators in one go. It gives you the gravitational currents that you gauge, and it also gives you the 
uh, scalar supercharges that you have to take cohomology with respect to. And then there are some more terms, which are just derivatives of the same free functions. Importantly, the chi's are constant order parameters. Only the zero mode part of those currents are left. While these new chi's and t's are arbitrary fun holomorphic functions, so there, in that case, is still gauging the currents. And this goes by the name of, oops. Uh, this goes by the name of semi-rigid superconformal transformations. So this is like a, taking a Riemann surface, but making it only patching things with respect to a subgroup of all possible conformal transformations. So it's like slightly rigid. It cannot fluctuate in arbitrary ways. That's why it's called a semi-rigid subalgebra. So our theory of topological supergravity is now simply going to be the theory that we obtain by gauging the subalgebra of the small superconformal algebra, small n equals to algebra. So let me write that down explicitly. Gauging these, you identify what currents these gauge transformation parameters correspond to, and you find that it's exactly, well, you get the deformed curly T stress tensor for free, that was T plus half del J, and then the two psi alphas that had survived correspond to the two charged minus one supercurrents, which after twisting, so with respect to this twisted stress tensor curly T, the G's become spin two as well. And what I've done here is I've just decomposed the alpha index and just called them G and H for notational brevity. So there's curly T, there's two supercurrents of spin two that are G and H, and then there's the U1 R symmetry current that was <coughs> preserving everything, preserving the micron, and that was the gen that was generated by this parameter T here, and that becomes a new and probably the most important for us current K, which is again another spin two current. As the presence of this current K in the gauging that reduces the degrees of freedom to self UGR. And you also get the G naught alpha, G naught plus alphas, the zero modes of the twisting supercharges for free. So this is what I meant earlier. I'm only gonna keep a linear combination of the twisting supercharges in my BRST charge. But since the subalgebra allows for both of the supercharges together, there might be some sense in which I could activate both of them. I just don't know how to activate both of those how do you add a constant supercharge to a BRST charge? That's what I don't know. Anyway, there might be some way to, this procedure did not give me a choice of U alpha, that's what I mean, and there might be some way to average over all possible U alphas to recover the twister sphere. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna stay simple and I'm just gonna pick a choice of U alpha, and then the BRST charge that generates those uh, so in conformal gauge, the combined BRST charge of the twisted sigma model and our new topological supergravity theory, which you get by gauging these currents, is give, you can compute explicitly, and that's given by this expression. Is it, can I ask something? Is it trivial that this is topological? I mean, what, uh, just because you are supposed to remove all degrees of freedom with the gauging, that's, that's the logic? No, no, no. It, you have to actually show that this comes from an actual covariant theory of topological gravity. So we're actually in the process of doing that, but at least for the gravitational bit, we have managed to show that you start with Witten's <coughs> topological gravity. It has like some well well sheet metric H alpha beta, and you gauge the symmetry H alpha beta goes to H alpha beta plus arbitrary shifts, okay? And that's the transformation that this curly T generates for you. And uh, what we now need to show is that there's like a covariant supergravity where there's a gravity, you know, which has a similar shift symmetry. So we are in the process of doing that. We believe it will work because the BRST charge exists. And it's a very nice theory. And it squares to zero, you can check it. But uh, yeah, we're almost there, but I believe it will work. It's not that hard. You just have to write down some BRST transformations in a covariant language and just check it. But this is uh, the BRC charge in conformal gauge. And uh, that's what the semi-rigid supergravity formalism of Jacques Diesler and Philip Nelson straight up gives you. You have some ghosts. So there are some BC ghosts for curly T, the Minnesota ghosts. There are a pair of super There are a pair of bosonic ghosts, beta and gamma. So beta, alpha, gamma, alpha. 
that corresponds to G and H. And then there's another fermionic ghost system, Mn, which will correspond to this uh, SU2, this U1 current, capital K. And all these currents are spin two, so all the ghosts are spin minus one, and all the anti-ghosts are spin two. Okay. So this is the BRC charge of the gravitational sector of the theory. And this is the BRC charge of the, this is the twisting supercharge, but corrected by the ghosts. So before coupling to gravity, there would have been no ghost corrections to this. You would have just had the zero mode of U alpha G plus alpha as your twisting supercharge. Once you couple to topological gravity, you also get some very simple ghost corrections, which really don't do much. Yeah. Can I give you as a kind of web of some other ghosts that are not coupled to gravity? Maybe some sometimes on the large end of the score. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just not telling you about it for reasons of time. Otherwise I would have to write down four more ghosts and take more. Yeah. Uh, it's so what Jack did was just freeze it to its web. And then I thought that's what the people are doing, but apparently not. Like in Twisted Supergravity, and Kevin and you guys are expanding around the web and then showing that everything else dies or is a Q exact cohomology. What Jacques did was just he had some spin zero ghosts after twisting. After twisting the stress tensor, some ghosts become spin zero, and you just freeze them to that web, and that's U alpha. So that was the other reason I didn't want to mention this, because I'm still trying to pin down what's the relation between this old formalism and Kevin's twisted supergravity ideas that work in higher dimensions. But yeah, stay tuned, I guess. Okay, so in summary, we have learned that we have to get. When do you want me to stop there? Oh, no, I mean, sorry, no questions, no time for questions. Okay, let me, let me finish that. In summary, we have learned that we have to gauge the stress tensor, a pair of supercurrents that get picked out, and a pair of at a U1 uh, current capital K from the SU2, Katz Moody. And they're all spin two. Jacques told me this looks like a Borel subalgebra of the n equals four algebra, so maybe that's another way you could have imagined picking out these. And then you have to take invariance with respect to, well, gauge invariance with respect to those currents, and invariance with respect to the twisting supercharge that I wrote down. So the next subtle step that comes out comes up when you're doing the actual Volchi gravity is that gauging the gravitational currents imposes certain off-shell constraints. So it gives you the equation of motion, but it also imposes certain off-shell constraints on the Hilbert space of states when you try to write a string field theory. So we will need to restrict attention. So in just standard topological gravity, when it restricts attention to the subspace of Hil states that are in the kernel of antisymmetric combinations of the left and right moving charges. So L here, Ln generate, Ln correspond to the modes of the twister stress tensor curly T. And for example, I'm gonna denote L naught minus L naught tilde by just L naught with a superscript minus. And similarly, we'll have to take the, we'll have to pick out the subspace of off-shell states, which are in the kernel of the other supercharges antisymmetric linear combinations. The G naught minus will be G naught minus G naught tilde, and H naught will be H naught minus H naught tilde, and so uh, Conveniently, as Witten observed, I think, uh, in his topological gravity case, and then as we observed in this case, the same pattern with, curly T is just the action of the twisting supercharge on uh, G, this supercurrent. And this you can show even after you couple to topological gravity. So you need all the ghost contributions to confirm this, but it all works out. That's another reason. Okay, so this is probably how you can motivate this topological. The stress tensor is Q exact, where Q is the full BRST charge. Actually, this should have been Q with a subscript B. And if the stress tensor is Q exact, then it sort of drops out of the theory. So translations on the Wells sheet drop out of the theory. And similarly, there's the supercurrent H and its right moving counterpart H tilde, which is also Q exact, 
So that's telling you that some kind of grab there's some kind of gravity, you know, whose shifts are also dropping out of the theory. And we're trying to develop a covariant formalism to describe that. Uh, what these Q closure conditions give you is that L naught minus, well, L's were the modes of curly T and H naught were the modes of H. So L naught minus and H naught minus closure become automatic on states that are Q closed. So at least on shell, they become automatic if you have G naught minus and K naught minus closures. So all we're going to do to build string field theory is restrict to the off-shell space of states that will be closed under G naught minus and K naught minus, and then the on-shell states will automatically be closed under the other ones. This is this is very similar to taking some kind of equated cohomology with respect to the or with respect to the. So the L naught minuses literally generate rotations in the spatial directions of the world sheet, and the other ones are somehow some kind of super cousins of that idea. Okay, so let's do this explicitly and then conclude. Recall that these world sheet target space identifications for the fermions, the etas were anti-holomorphic differential forms and the thetas were holomorphic vector fields. The operators of interest act as these nonlinear operators, so you can compute G naught minus and K naught minus as some nonlinear operators acting on the fields of the theory. G naught minus is familiar if you have come across BCOV theory to the aerospins of gravity. It's an odd square zero nilpotent supercharge. Differentiates once with respect to the polyvector and once with respect to the coordinate. K naught minus is the new thing. So if you've been, uh, if you've had a good sleep until now, it's a good time to wake up. <laughs> Lionel. <laughs> so, K naught minus is the new thing. Uh, this, in some, I haven't made this precise, but this somehow generate K naught minus closure becomes something like an SU two primary constraint for the space of states. There should be interesting relations to how Dolbo homology on hyperkähler spaces splits across the. Space splits via the representation theory of SUD. But anyway, the off-shell field content of BCOV theory is basically a polyvector polyform that you expand in these Grassmann variables theta and eta. Turns out you only need to take things that are linear in theta, one less dimension, one less than the dimension of this target space. The field of interest to us in self-dual gravity is phi tilde, which will be like a Lagrange multiplier that imposes that equation of motion that I had written earlier, Lubansky's equation, and a Beltrami differential mu, so this field, which will actually give rise to the scalar field phi of Lubansky once I impose G naught minus and K naught minus closure. In BCOV, one would just impose G naught minus psi equals zero as an optional constraint. In our new topological string, we also impose closure with respect to this SU2 primary constraint. So let's keep that, let's keep those two expressions in the back of our mind and do the example of interest, which is the field mu, this Beltrami differential. This mu comes from a complex structure deformation on C2. Uh, it's the world sheet avatar of that. You replace dx hat with eta and the alpha dot with theta. And first obtain as usual that g naught minus mu equals zero gives a divergence free constraint, which you can locally solve in terms of a pre-potential with a single dotted index. Okay. Next, we impose a new SU2 primary condition, and that tells you that this Beltrami differential has to be trace-free. Again, you just take that, act with the d by d theta on theta, and with the d by d eta on eta, you just get mu alpha alpha dot equals zero. And then you, you sort of take the intersection of these two, you get d alpha dot h alpha dot equals zero, which then further you can locally solve in two dimensions. This is because of the dimensionality. In two dimensions, the divergence free constraint is the same as uh, being Hamiltonian. And you solve this, and you get h alpha dot equals the derivatives of a single scalar field phi. 
no one's fine to mistake in this calculation. I'm very happy. <laughs> okay. You still haven't written down the answer. Sorry, you were about to. Sorry? You still haven't written down the Lebanski equation. Yeah, but that's the next five minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm just two slides from finishing. Anyway, so we obtain a theory of Beltrami's of the form two derivatives of pi and times that. And that's exactly the kind of Beltrami differential that gives you the deformation of complex structure associated to a Plabansky description. So d bar plus mu. The integrability of d bar plus mu gives you the Plabansky equation through the lax pair description. The string field theory can now be constructed by starting with BCOV theory in two complex dimensions and then restricting to a smaller Hilbert space of optional states. Let me just finish up now. The BCOV action if you don't know it, it's fine. Uh, this, uh, that's an interior product. Psi is the full string field. You interpret thetas and etas as polyvectors and polyforms. You hook it into this. This is a holomorphic D2x. I'm going to, in the next line, write D4x, which will be the real D4. But this is like the general structure of the BCIV action. And then you just plug in that string field and expand. The string field that satisfies the two constraints takes this form. So it has a scalar field phi, another scalar field phi. It has a scalar Grassmann ord field C and a scalar Grassmann ord phi. Uh, spin one Grassmann ord field B alpha dot. That's a not one form as some auxiliary scalar whose nature I'm still trying to understand. You just plug this field in into BC into BCOV on C2, and you get this action. Where the first term is phi tilde times the Plobansky equation on phi. The second term is some kind of Grassmann or holomorphic BF theory, which is coupled to the D bar operator associated to phi, so in this deformed hyperscalar structure. And the last term is some kind of anti fieldy thing, which you still have to understand, which is required for some kind of supersymmetries to exist in this model. So I've had discussions with David and Roland and other people, and it seems that this, so just like Plavansky is a gauge fixed version of self dual GR. This whole thing might be a gauge fixed version of n equals one self dual GR, and these might be some kind of gauge fixed fermions or gravitinos or something. So, but yeah, I'm looking at these things right now. Happy Lionel? Yeah, right. <laughs> That's SDGR. And now there are a lot of things to do. Let me just write these down. So one can also repeat this whole thing on higher dimensional hypercalar manifolds, but I don't know what equation of motion I'll get. Maybe it'll still describe hypercalar perturbations, but it doesn't immediately seem to give me the constraint that reduced me down to a single scalar field dependent on solving the divergence-free constraint, which used the lower dimensionality of the target. Maybe there's a more general version of that that works on higher dimensions, but not in terms of a single scalar field. And then uh, the other reasons why we're interested in studying this, me, Kumra, and Matt, is that open strings in this theory, especially D brains of lower dimensions, might help us find holographic dualities for SDGR like theories. But that's work in progress, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yeah, so in the topological string, what happens is that the action of the sigma model is Q exact. Alpha prime sits in front of the action, and uh, since it's Q exact, nothing can depend on alpha prime. So, you, you know, you can take a saddle point approximation, and then you can send alpha prime to infinity zero. Sorry, you can send alpha prime to <coughs> zero. So the action will be one over alpha prime times something q exact. You send alpha prime to zero, you get a saddle point approximation. And that saddle point approximation is exact because the action is q exact. It's localization, basically, in this simple example. It's a Wedge in some possibility, if it's the topological model. Oh, right. This is the B model. So we won't have Wedge in symptoms. If this was the A model, we would have in symptoms. In the B model, the equations of motion that minimize the potential are just constant maps. So there's no holomorphic instance. I'm not sure my question is meaningful, but uh, what happens with the 
uh, anomaly uh, which in, uh, in your case, uh, which in the case of the usual topological string leads to the condition of the target space that it should be collabial or threefold. The target is hypercalar, so it's collabial. But so, uh, but the, and I did the twisting. But do so you have such an anomaly or just? You yeah. Don't have yeah. My theory you can view as a subsector of the B model. And the twisting that I use, T goes to T plus half del J on both sides, that's the symmetry. The, the symmetry that I twisted with, that is the symmetry that gets anomalous at one loop level in a, in a general sigma model. But uh, since hypercalar manifolds are collabia, that won't be a problem here. Absolutely. It's still there. It's still there, but, but it's I've chosen a good target. I've chosen the correct. Uh, oh, sorry, so there are presumably D1 instantons here, are there? I mean, this is, this is, at least there were in the Twister string, which was said to be a D1. So, 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 so there should be some D1 instantons in, in the story. Well, this is not a, yeah, probably. Uh, the thing is, I have to sit down and find all the D brain boundary conditions that preserve this semi rigid N equals 4 symmetry that I'm gauging. And so the, oh, there so might so be very the, few D-brains in this theory. So it's not just simply a B-model, it's got this way, it's got its semi rigid something or other structure. Yeah, so it's distinguished from the B-model in that the world sheet gravity that I've coupled it to is different. I see. In the B-model one, so you know how in bosonic string you couple to bosonic gravity, in super string you couple to some, you gauge some super current as well. That's what's happening here. I've gauged some extra currents. So the gravitational theory is slightly different. And so the brains, the boundary conditions that I have to write should also preserve some diagonal subgroup of those symmetries and I see. So, 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 so that I can gauge them in the open string. Yeah. yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Just have to sit down and not go to all these workshops, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you keep inviting me. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the question. So the gene norm minus constraint, the divergent string constraint. Was the statement that you were deforming the complex manifold as a Calabria manifold? I think so, yeah. It looked very much like your remaining K0 constraint, your new thing, was saying that you were deforming it actually as a hypercalar manifold. Not In C2, manifold. that power is panned out, yeah. I, I see that's how it panned out because you, you got a bounce of failure coming out, but was it clear? Does the geometric operation what that, what that came Not out? right now. I feel like this is just me not knowing the right math of how the Dolbo complex and hypercalar manifold splits under the SU2 representation theory. I think it's just the K0 minus one is just picking out some subset. So you'd have the Dol the complex, uh, you'd have the sheep of Beltrami, so one, PV minus one, one. And then that would first split into some representations of the SU2. And maybe the statement is something like the K0 minus constraint picks out a particular element of that representation. Uh, and then if my deformation lies in that element, then it preserves the hypercalar structure. Maybe it's something like that. I just need to read some old papers, like the papers by, even recent papers by Anthony Ashmore and other people who've done this for G2 manifolds and other things. So I think there's some, there should be some structure there. And that should be useful to study the higher dimensional case systematically. This is maybe a dumb question, but the action you got at the end, what's the interpretation of phi twiddle? Are you somehow getting perturbations away from the hypercalar sector as well? No, that's just a Lagrange model. Right? Okay, very phi and it will obey an equation of motion as well. Uh, yeah, so phi twiddle will be like, it's like a BF theory, so phi twiddle satisfies the. Yeah, but in a BF theory, you usually think of the B field as giving you linearized perturbations away from the f equals zero. Right. Yeah, I mean, I suppose. Uh, I just meant that there's no phi tilde squared type interaction here to actually move you away. But probably. Phi, yeah. Phi tilde is, but yeah, just on the face of it, phi, the equation of motion of phi tilde says I solve the Laplace equation in this hypercalar metric that I get for phi. So it's like, it would be interesting for on a K3 surface, when you could do a string compactification, oh gosh, I don't want to use these words here. When I do string compactification on a K3 surface, I have to find harmonic forms on the K3, and uh, if I tell that would probably act like a harmonic form, or like a base, yeah, harmonic function in this case. Oh, there is an interpretation as a super potential, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs>
Yeah. Trade secrets. Is there any more questions? Let's, let's thank you again. Thank you.